last time Lordran, this time Dronlik. The starting zone is a short jog to this cozy office where local plastic surgeons do customization. We can fight an ogre on the alternate route upstream, and beyond is a straight path to the main game with peripheral tree trips featuring free tips, although there exist a few tricks in the mix and things betwixt. There's another ogre on the beach over here guarding a coffin that lets us change our character model, and we can return to the house to redistribute our stats later once we get a soul vessel. But there's no capital B boss to kill us at the end of the tutorial this time. Instead, at the end of the forest path is Majula, this game's Firelink Shrine equivalent where we can pick a direction and get started. There are a few merchants around and people will come and go. Our level up lady wants us to meet the king, but our soul is frail and pallid. Luckily, there are four immense souls in the region that will restore our soul glow, but alas, their names are unutterable. For now, we gotta seek larger, more powerful souls, seek the king, lest the land swallow us whole. Like Dark Souls, there's one path that's understood to be the recommended first choice, the Forest of Fallen Giants, through an underground cave below the hill we arrived upon. Unlike Dark Souls, we are also free to revisit the starting zone at any time right from the start. But there's more. Across Majula's clearing, there's a mountainside door leading to a fork in the road which we currently cannot toggle. We can only go right, to Hades' Tower of Flame, which is the more advanced starting area. It's manageable, especially for series veterans, but the enemies are big and resilient, the footing is treacherous, and the bosses are more difficult. The other other door off Majula leads to the Shaded Woods, but we quickly encounter a petrified statue blocking the way, so we'll come back later once we get an unpetrifying stick. We can get our first one soon, but not in Majula. Finally, the Deep Well and the guy next to it who builds ladders, and the cat merchant 20 feet away selling a ring that reduces fall damage. Brave players can use these tools to plummet down a sequence of haphazard planks to the grave of saints halfway down the pit, or even further down to the lowest ledge beyond. But these choices are advanced destinations and an ambush of exploders awaits at the bottom. There's also a locked door in the well that doesn't lead to a new area per se, but we'll open it later. So for an easy life, our first foray will be into the forest of the fallen giants. Through the cave, another ogre patrols this nice little river path. By the way, if you don't see an ogre, you're playing the original version of Dark Souls 2, not the DLC revised Scholar of the First Sin edition, which rearranges some enemies and items and integrates the DLC and stuff. That's the one I'm talking about. Past the river is an overgrown tower that serves as our entrance to the forest fortress. Across the clearing, through dark hallways, we come up on this wall with a ladder to our first outlying bonfire, the Cardinal Tower. From the face of the tower, there's a drop off a ledge to a valley with some goodies that connects around later. Near the bonfire is the merchant Melentia, who sells a fragrant branch of yore which we can use to unpetrify statues like the one near Shaded Woods. Downstairs, there's an exit to this other courtyard full of rickety rooftops and walkways, and on the far side of the little burrow we can meet Kale, a lowly cartographer. Up a route over here, we remount the wall where explosive barrels make the fighting more fun. They can blow a hole in the wall right here and open a shortcut back to the cardinal bonfire. This big rooftop up a ladder is where we can fight the Pursuer, who isn't a boss here, but he will be later and mostly kill him right now. Around the corner and down is a grass alley with some ambush rooms and sneaky pate, a fossilized giant corpse, and a path through the outer wall. We check out the giant sword, then head through the back door to the cardinal basement where an elevator leads to the first official boss, the last giant. He drops the soldier's key. If we use it to unlock a different tower exit, we can find this courtyard with a guarded door that says to produce the symbol of the king, so a mental note there. We can actually skip the last giant until we have that symbol, he is not required until then. Lastly, there is a staircase at one end of the outer wall that leads to the battlements. This is where we fight the pursuer if we didn't kill him before. At the far end is a bird's nest with an examine prompt. You know what to do. We're now flown to the lost Bastille, jutting out along the water. The first great soul is very close by, but first, let's look at the other route to get to this point. If we follow that fork near Majula to the Tower of Flame, we navigate these broken plazas over the water until we hit another fork at this big rotunda. The left path leads to a red dragon waiting over here and requires us to use this mechanism to lower the bridge. It terminates at the Cathedral of Blue with a fight against the old Ornstein armor. Beating him opens up this area for PvP arena battles. The right path is a short way to another boss fight with the Dragon Rider. This one's made easier if we find the levers here and here to raise additional rings around the periphery of his room. Upstairs we find Licia of Lindelt, the miracle seller, who we should definitely talk to, a bonfire, and the bridge to this little connective bit. It consists of a curved two-floor hallway with an elevator on the first floor that takes us to a similar but floated hallway down below. At the far end, a hole in the wall leads to a stalagmite cave with the Unseen Path bonfire. By the way, there's no key item in this game like the Lord Vessel to enable warping between bonfires. Not everyone likes this decision, but the game is way more sprawling than the first, so I think it's kind of necessary. 
Past the cave is No Man's Wharf, which is a shipwreck cove-looking place with wooden docks and wet rocks. There are a lot of bad guys and places to drown and blind corners, so this area can be kind of slow. Luca Teal is in the house over here. People like her. The second half is fun once we light the lamps to make the Dark Dwellers retreat and pull the bell to bring that ship on in. We can wheel and deal with Gavlin as we fight our way out to the ship and go below decks where we fight with the Flexile Sentry in the hold. This is a cool setting as the hold fills with water throughout the fight, slowing us down. Like the bird's nest before, we examine the ship's compass thing to sail to the next area. Ta-da! The Lost Bastille, again. The two starting roads have converged, kind of. This is another fancy fortress area. The ship drops us off at a dock below this long staircase, while the bird drops us in this crumbling tower on the far side. This outer area has some of that classic, am I supposed to be doing this, Dark Souls feel, hugging along tiny ledges and rolling into cliffside doorways. There are some nasty exploders, and we run into another pursuer in this courtyard. Luca Teal's over here in this corner tower again, or for the first time, depending on the order in which we do things. From the stairs, we can drop off the battlements over here and open a one-way door alongside this building to actually connect both paths through the alley before we head inside. The interior of the Bastille is a mess of courtyards and exploding things, and in the center we take on the three ruined sentinels. Behind an illusory wall, we end up at this rampart tower, and upstairs from there, through some tricky rooms, we reach a long bridge. Along the way, there's a ladder going down that leads over here to Belfry Luna, where we can fight another returning Dark Souls boss, times two, in the rooftop gargoyles, and get their Bastille key. Across the long bridge is Sinner's Rise. We're heading to another soggy basement. This is like a trolley area with high water and more exploding. All the way at the end is our lost Sinner boss battle, which becomes easier if we use the Bastille key to light these torches to illuminate the arena on either side. One of the spoils from the battle is another unpetrifying stick in case we need a hint about what to do next. We now have our first soul of an old one. That's pretty much all the level up lady has to say when we get back to Majula. We could use one of those fragrant branches to get further into the shaded woods now, but Licia has moved to Majula as well, and she happens to be posted up at the fork over here, and she'll move that path if we ask. So obviously, let's see where it goes. It goes through a dark cave, past a dark creep, to a dark copse. A huntsman's copse. Another gloom zone, split in half by this canyon. From under the bridge, we make our way up, and there's an optional area through this valley full of annoying dudes and across the rope bridge. This is the Undead Purgatory, which looks suspiciously like a racetrack. We can joust with the Executioner's Chariot and unlock the Brotherhood of Blood PvP arenas afterwards. There are two paths along the far canyon. The cave entrance will lead to a locked gate, so we need to take the left cliff path around and open it to create a shortcut. There's an Undead Lockaway key halfway along that also opens the Bonfire Hut. At the end of the canyon is another big building that's the Skeleton Lord's Turf. Past them is the Harvest Valley. This is the closest we get to a poison swamp zone, with this green fog in the lowland areas. We have to climb up and open this gate along the way. Along a couple embankments is the Earthen Peak, which itself is fairly short. It has another sort of environmental puzzle where the boss Mytha is surrounded by poison unless we use our torch to set this windmill on fire during our exploration. After Mytha, we go up the stairs and into this elevator and just take that right on up. The Iron Keep, where Bowser awaits. This first bridge where we arrive is pretty popular for dueling. Throughout the keep, we're fighting knights and dodging arrows and not falling into the lava lake. The very first room has an iron key sitting under a flamethrower that we'll want later. After the first couple areas and an optional fight with the smelter demon over in his cylinder, we can choose to visit Belfry Soul over here. If you farmed a certain covenant item like I did, you visited Belfry Soul a lot of times. The final stretch of the keep has these turtle guys on these collapsing frames with flamethrowers and little rooms. It's crazy. Up in the head of the bull statue is a bonfire and a lever to turn off all the flamethrowers, like that one over in the Iron Key, before we descend the rooftop to the surface to take on the old Iron King on this little ledge. Beat him, and we now have the souls of two old ones. That's pretty much all the level up lady has to say when we get back to Majula. We might also notice a cool and sinister snake statue down here in the back room, which can teleport us to a locked door that we'll be able to open later. So, if we've explored thoroughly, we have two options left, up or down. Let's break out an unpetrifying stick, unfreeze the lady, fend off the poison goblins, and head into the shaded woods. After a little jog under the arches, we arrive at the ruined fork bonfire. To the left, we find this small bit of rubble blocking the gate that we shall not deign to step over, and if we try to go around, we'll run into the imposing Shrine of Winter. It isn't open yet. If we go straight at the Ruined Fork, we'll run into another big door requiring the symbol of the king. It isn't open yet. That leaves the right door, which dumps us out into the mist. Around the perimeter there are some treasures and ghosts lurk in the trees, but our destination is this far path towards the shaded ruins. 
Here we can actually see a bit while we fight these lion guys and make our way past all the poison. There's a man scorpion named Tark we can befriend over here, a hole in the ground where we can meet that dark dude again, and up the side road is the boss, Scorpioness Najka. Now we plow ahead to the doors of Pharos, aka the Rat Zone. We're in water again, but now we can use our Pharos lockstones to unlock some of the many doors here. In the second room around the upper ledge, we can fight the Royal Rat Authority, we can join the Rat King Covenant, and we can use that to pull people into our game and mess with them using the traps and enemies enabled by the lockstones. Anyway, up past the doors is a path to Brightstone Cove Seldora. This is a nice descent from the Royal Army campsite down through some spider hole rooms to with lower caves and sandy buildings. At one end is an approach over a spiky bridge to the Church of Spiders, and behind that is a big room taken over by spider webs that are mercifully not sticky. At the bottom in the corner, we can challenge the mega spider, Duke's Dear Freya. After the battle, we reclaim a third old soul, not from the spider, but technically from the dead dragon decomposing in its web, and return to Majula. At this point, the well is our only remaining option. As I mentioned, there are actually two stops to make on our way down. The first is the optional Grave of Saints, aka the other rat zone, with a killer entrance statue. Similar rat rules here as we make our way down the tunnels, past the Royal Rat Vanguard boss, and ultimately to a bridge over the muddy pit. This is the same room we can skip to further down from the original well, and past the exploders and down some ominously familiar planks, if you remember Blight Town, is the gutter. A maze of wooden structures and goblins and near total darkness until we light up some of the torches. Your direction and destination are difficult to discern at any given time. In the end, we actually have to drop off the structure onto the rocky floor of the cavern itself and head into an even deeper corner cave, always down. There's an evil green glow as we approach the Black Gulch. This is the bottom of this world, inhabited by oil beasts and spitting statues. There's a bonfire early on, and a difficult-to-detect ledge on the edge of darkness we can drop down and face off with two lonely giants. I always felt like this was one of the more unsettling encounters in a Souls game, although we might feel a little more sympathetic to them later. Beating them yields a forgotten key, which we can use to open that other door in the Majula well. Up top, past a field of pools, there's a hidden bonfire around the side and a boss fight with the corpse pile rotten below. For my money, the rotten is the easiest of the old souls to fight. I'll return to this idea in a second. Near his bonfire is another one of those sinister snake teleporters. That's it. We've explored everywhere we can without the symbol of the king, except the Shrine of Winter, which will now open for us. It contains a third and final snake teleporter, we're going to use all these later, and through the tunnel past the shrine, we finally arrive at Drunglik Castle. There's a simple puzzle out front where we need to kill enemies in close proximity to some soul bowls to open the door, we'll repeat that inside also. Past the entrance is a winding ascent in and out of the castle to Queen Nishandra. There are a few points of interest. This room with six hidden walls that hide ruined sentinels. The dirt crawl space beneath it with that dark diver guy again, more on him later a boss fight with two dragon riders, and beyond, Queen Nishandra. The queen sits aside an empty throne and says we need to visit Vendrick, the king. He isn't here, but he's kind of close. Past her is one last little loop area with an elevator up to this tower prison where we find the key to the king's passage. There's also another imposing king's door, and hopefully we'll find the frozen flower key item. King's Passage is really just a room over here leading out of the back of the castle, but the looking glass knight guards the exit with his mirror shield ready to summon in additional muscle. Now there's another long elevator, and we find ourselves in a more naturalistic setting. The Shrine of Amana is notoriously frustrating, especially in early versions of the game. It's mostly flooded with waist-high water that hides frequent cliffs, has heavies and ambush predators and long-range sorcerers with homing soul arrows that can all combine together to make for an unpleasant time. In the second area especially, we need to use the ruins to shield ourselves from magic spells while we deal with the melee fighters up close. The Shrine has a few hidden paths under the water as well. There's a bridge over here to a door we can't open before meeting Vendrick, a Pharos contraption over here, and a long path out to some treasure following these columns. Again, on the map it's obvious, but during gameplay, not so much. Beyond is more slogging through this cave and around the corner to the lovely Demon of Song boss. Past the boss and an optional side path to more treasure is the Undead Crypt. The gimmick here is how dark it is, and the NPC Agdane turns hostile if we or the little torch goblin following us gets any light in his personal space. The actual area isn't terribly long, and after the first few rooms we have this big open chasm with some dirt graves arranged across the way, and a lot of ambushing as we make our way down to the other side to a long hall full of enemies. At the end, past another dragon rider, is the proper boss of the area, Velstadt, the Royal Aegis, which is like his personal bodyguard. Behind him we can finally meet King Vendrick, or what's left of him. 
Instead, we can just take the king's ring behind him. This is the symbol of the king the game's been asking us to produce for so long. So that means it's time to turn around and return to some of them. The three doors we've come across were past the ruined fork in Shaded Woods, at the end of the Forest of the Fallen Giants, and near the central bonfire in Castle Drongluck. The Drongluck door is closest, and there we can encounter the Emerald Herald again, who says we have to fight Nashandra if we proceed to the throne, that being the Throne of Want up ahead. However, going there now will only lead to a fight with the Throne Watcher and Throne Defender. Afterwards, a whole lot of nothing. Hmm. The Fallen Giant's door at the base of the Cardinal Tower just leads to a courtyard with another one of those fossilized giants. So we need to head down the Shaded Woods Fork, open the door, and enter the courtyard to Aldia's Keep. Aldia, by the way, is Vendrick's brother and the titular Scholar of the First Sin, who might have jump-scared you a couple times by now. This is his personal house of horrors, a bit like Seath in the first game, where we get to fight through a museum of his failed experiments with creatures. There's a big dragon skeleton at the entrance, and this long hall was fairly eventful with ogres and other surprises. There's a gnarly room over an acid pit with a pile of dead giant corpses in it that'll probably make more sense later. The path is straightforward, and at the end we fight the guardian dragon in a big cage thing Aldia had built for him. After the dragon, we go up and up and up. This is the Dragon Airy. The first bonfire is over the small bridge here, and in the old days we'd have to cross another bridge, go through a cave and some more bridges, fight a few red dragons along the way, and eventually zip line over to this little chimney to kick a ladder down to our bonfire, and zip line over to the big scary bridge out. In Scholar, this was all changed so that the ladder is just kicked down right away, and we can zip line past the whole level if we want to, for lore accurate reasons. This will finally bring us to the Dragon Shrine, which is short and painful. No dragons to fight for most of it, but we run into a bunch of these big metal guys as we climb and climb up the big staircase. We can find a petrified egg in this tower over here that unlocks a dragon covenant in Majula. This is guarded by even more strong dudes, and I was not a fan of this area in general when I was trying to repeatedly visit my dragon friend at the top. This is the ancient dragon, who sets the end game in motion by giving us the Ashen Mist Heart, which says we can delve into memories of the withered. We can choose to fight the dragon as well, but it's not the best dragon fight in the series, and it kind of feels bad, at least until we learn the whole story. Alright, memories of withered remains. Well, there's the obvious one, King Vendrick himself, who we've already grave robbed. There's these giant fossils we know must be important because we found one behind a king's door. There's also one we've seen in the lower forest, and a third one near the pursuer's arena. Finally, there's one that's easy to miss, but let's cover it first. In Freya's spider den, we got that important soul originally from the dead dragon that the spider apparently dragged down here. We can return and now dive into the dead dragon's dream and see an eerie memory of something like the dragon airy and get the actual ancient dragon's soul. The three giant memories are related, but only one's required to beat the game. They each take us to the past in the Forest of the Fallen Giants during a war between Vendrick soldiers and an army of attacking giants seeking revenge for that time Vendrick and his brother kidnapped some giants and experimented on them. In the memory of Vimar, Captain Drummond explains what's going on, and we fight past some giants along the street to get our first soul of a giant. In the memory of Oro, we visit the same area from above for another. And in the memory of Jay, we fight along the same battlements to meet the giant lord in battle. Beating him will give us a third soul of the giant and a key item called the giant's kinship. Plus, it'll turn him into the last giant boss later. Finally, there is the memory of the king. In this DLC edit area, we can talk to actual King Vendrick, who's pretty regretful of how things played out. He also says to find the ancient crowns. That seems suspiciously unrelated to everything else going on. Anyway, taking our giant's kinship back to the Throne of Want triggers the final boss with Nishandra, and we can beat the game. But what did we miss? There is one optional area and boss that isn't part of the DLC. The weird guy I've mentioned, Dark Diver Grandal, appears in three spots. A hole in the Shaded Ruins, a chamber in that dark cave under the Black Gulch, and the dirt room underneath Dranglet Castle. Once we find him at each one, we can join his Pilgrims of the Dark Covenant and offer him humanities for a portal into the Dark Chasm of Old. This is three separate locations, each with evil phantoms to battle in the darkness until we find these three fires and light them. Afterwards, we can drop into the abyss at the end to leave each one. Lighting all three fires requires three separate trips, at which point trying to leave will instead drop us into the Dark Lurker's Cavern, where we fight this cool-looking boss who splits into two. So that leaves the DLC and its three crowns. Let's summarize the remaining threads. We found a forgotten key from the giants in the Black Gulch. This opens the stone door partway down the well, where we'll get the Dragon Talon, and that opens the door through the teleporter behind the Rotten. The Iron Key from the Iron Keep can be used to reach the bottom of the Cardinal Tower more safely, where a heavy Iron Key waits in the fiery Salamander Pit. This opens the door through the teleporter behind the old Iron King. 
The frozen flower can be found in Drunglet Castle, and that, unsurprisingly, opens the snowy door through the teleporter in the Shrine of Winter. So let's visit them in the order they were originally released. The Dragon Talon unlocks a cave path that opens into a huge underground cavern. This is Shulva, Sanctum City. It's centered around a massive pyramid structure in the center. We make our way along a cliff path to the upper parts of the towers where we can raise and lower them as elevators to reach a bridge leading to the Sanctum. In the Sanctum itself, there are some Zelda light puzzles involving shooting arrows at these little buttons to raise things or spin things or open things. We can find an eternal Sanctum key that opens a door in this tower leading to the optional Cave of the Dead, which ends in an obnoxious 3 vs 1 boss fight. The overall goal is to descend to the floor of the big cave where the circular stone shrine will raise the main bridge back up top. A convenient nearby elevator returns us there, and we cross over to another super tall room that we have to carefully drop down to reach ground level again. And this time we take the other exit to the double boss battle of this area. Alana, the squalid queen, followed by Sin, the slumbering dragon, who apparently crashed down here and puked up a bunch of his poison and generally caused problems. Killing him grants the crown of the sunken king. Back through the Iron Keep snake portal, our heavy iron key will open the door to the sweeping vista of Broom Tower. This is sort of like exploring a big chimney. We'll find some smelter wedges, six now and five more in the tower, that can destroy ashen idols with different effects, so more puzzle stuff. We're going to have to make our way down the interior of the big tower by ladder and gravity, while preferably using fire arrows to blow up all the zombies with explosive barrels waiting to ambush us amidst the fire-throwing statues. At the bottom is a nasty room where we have to drop out of a cage into a waiting melee. From there, we come back outside and around a cliffside road full of battles, then finally get into the lower chamber of the tower, the foyer. Next is this big lever puzzle room made of iron bars, spike walls, and flamethrower traps that is quite a trial. We end up making our way over to this other tower to get a scorching iron scepter, taking it back to the foyer and using it to restart the elevators there. With the lifts working in the main tower, we can get a tower key from the ash plane and use it to open the iron passage down below. This area, and the Cave of the Dead before, are challenge areas where players without the DLC could still be summoned if they left their summon sign in the right place, which is why the fights are tough and probably why the look and layout are so dull. The boss fight here is also a reskin, with a smelter demon, but blue. Elsewhere, taking the elevators up, we can find the smelter throne at the top of this side tower, and touch the armor to visit the memory of the old Iron King. This is another really difficult area full of samurai ending on a boss fight with Sir Alon. Lastly, taking the elevators down leads to a long path to the very base of the tower, where inside a giant corpse we battle the Fume Knight, who is made easier if we saved some smelter wedges. We can claim the crown of the old Iron King and take our leave. Finally, teleporting from the Shrine of Winter with the Frozen Flower will lead to the Frozen Alium Lois. Through the main gate we run into a light blizzard, and if we go left we'll have to battle the King's pet Ava, who is invisible. Instead, let's go right and make our way down to the snowy city streets. There are some frozen chests along the way we can't open yet as we go down and through some houses to come back up and out onto the ramparts. From here we can head out to a fiery tower and get the Eye of the Priestess to reveal invisible enemies. From here there's a convenient shortcut route under the wall to arrive back at the main gate where we fight Ava now that we can actually see it, and after that we're at the Grand Cathedral. In here, Queen Alsana will tell us about the Ivory King and how he sacrificed himself to contain the chaos under the city. If we agree to put him out of his misery, she'll kill the blizzard and all that ice we saw before will thaw. But before we take him on, a little more. Over here, in a cave, we can find the Garrison Ward Key, and that opens this tower out on the ramparts. In here, we can hop in a coffin and take another trip to the frigid outskirts. This is probably the most hated Dark Souls zone. We can barely see anything whilst getting kicked by horses constantly as we cross the tundra. This is, of course, the co-op fun zone for this DLC. At the far end, we fight Lud and Zalin, who are the other two king's pets. Finally, as the Queen advises, there are three bummed-out Lois Knights we can find and inspire to join us in our final battle. One's in a tower at the end of a curved path, one is within the outer wall, and one is out in this distant fortress. With those three, plus the one who is already waiting, we can drop into the old chaos. After sealing some portals and defeating the burnt Ivory King when he shows up, we get the crown of the Ivory King. And that's it. We can take the three crowns to the Undead Crypt and visit the memory of King Vendrick to receive his thoughts and his blessing. Then we can return to the Throne of Want and beat Nishandra to finish the game feeling more fulfilled, and provided we've also vanquished Vendrick, we will now face the Scholar himself, Vendrick's brother Aldia. He's kind of a giant flaming root head man at this point, but if we beat him, we can pick our ending. In terms of design, compared to Dark Souls 1, this one's even more open-ended. 
we can go in any of the four primary directions, more or less. There's a branch a short ways into the forest if we want to go to the Shaded Ruins first, and the Silver Cat Ring isn't too expensive if we want to go down the well. For our first boss, we can start with the Pursuer or the Last Giant, the Dragon Rider or the Old Dragon Slayer, Scorpionist Najka, the Royal Rat Vanguard, or the Rotten. Even Drunglik's twin Dragon Riders, the Dark Lurker, or Ava can be your first boss if you grind out a million souls to open the Shrine of Winter. In fact, the minimal route through the game is to do that, meet Vendrick, meet the dragon, kill the last giant so we can get his key to kill the giant lord in the memory, and beat the game. That's like 9 bosses out of 41 that are required. And that's it. We did Dark Souls 2. Also, I did Dark Souls 2. Link to that in the description. Thanks for watching.